स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया गुड मॉर्निंग सो यस्टरडे वी स्टॉप्ड वेर वी वर टॉकिंग अबाउट गॉड फादर्स क्लेम टू फेम एंड हाउ इट हैज बीन कैनाइज ओवर अ पीरियड ऑफ फोर्टी और लास्ट फोर्टी फोर्टी फाइव ईयर्स एंड वी स्टॉप्ड वेर वी वर टॉकिंग अबाउट हाउ पॉल इन कील वन ऑफ द मोस्ट एमिनेंट फिल्म क्रिटिक्स इट शी कॉल्ड इट द बेस्ट गैंगस्टर फिल्म एवर मेड इन दिस कंट्री विच इज अ बिग शॉट बिकॉज gangster is essentially an american product um the other being the western yeah so there are two impo- influential american uh, genres which are essentially americans and which are one is gangster and another western and if godfather is labeled the best gangster film ever made by none other than paul and keel then it must have made quite an impact at that point now from here we will talk about the advent of new hollywood and how capola was at the center of the so called new hollywood movement so we had the french new wave we had the italian neo realism and then we had the hollywood or the new hollywood period the hollywood new wave and capola was at the center of it so uh, how how uh, how do you create uh, a movement how do you usher in a movement uh, so the, uh, whenever we calls that uh, a particular period is new if it's new hollywood then there has to be old hollywood as well okay and old hollywood was essentially what we call what we label as the classic hollywood we will be talking about classic hollywood as well today we are not talking new hollywood in much detail but understanding the godfather as a canonical text okay and we were doing it as continuation of uh, understanding what's a canon we have already done citizen kane so i'm just uh, uh, recapping whatever we have do- been doing earlier so today is, this class is not about new hollywood per se but just to give you an introduction to what is canon and then a brief overview of the new hollywood period and how capola became the center of the so called period of uh, new, new hollywood which was basically ushered in by warren beatty and arthur penn in bonnie and clyde warren beatty uh, acted and produced a movie called bonnie and clyde majorly scripted by someone called robert town is the name familiar to you an excellent screenplay writer i want you to do a good search on robert town because today i am going to refer to robert town uh, with reference to the godfather as well so robert town was essentially a screen writer also a director but more uh, his fame is by being a screen writer and he started his career with bonnie and clyde so bonnie and clyde started the so called period of new hollywood now capola who already had three art films not so successful before the godfather and uh, if you read up uh, some of his uh, autobiographies or works on capola you will find how much he had to struggle against the studio bosses and who was the studio uh, studio boss a paramount uh, studio and headed by at that point robert evans not robert town robert town was a screen writer robert evans the studio boss okay so um, and uh, uh, road blocks were put uh, before coppola at every step of the way he was prevented from casting al pacino that was the major setback and uh, there were there were times when he was uh, told that he will be fired okay any moment and there are people who are willing to take over because it was felt that uh, he is experimenting too much especially with the cinematography 
and bringing in all these uh, New York method actors. Remember, no one wanted Marilyn Brando. Today, it may appear huge. Today, it may appear to you that Godfather is inconceivable without Brando and Pacino combination. But there was a point when the Paramount Pictures, especially Robert Evans, they just didn't want these two men on board. So every day it would be Coppola is going to get fired or Pacino is going to get fired. Malin Brando came on board with much difficulty, and uh, that's another story altogether. Um, another successful movie now. The first Godfather was released in 72. We are still uh, not, uh, uh, we are still discussing 72 Godfather, not 74. Now, when seven, the 72 Godfather was released, it was also the year of the famous movie The French Connection. It got five awards, including Best Picture, Best Director, and also um, Gene Hackman. Yeah. So, um, Starring um, Rod Schneider and others. Okay, so that's the French Connection. Now, what kind of a movie is the French Connection? Directed by William Fritkin. You know, he later on went on to direct The Exorcist as well. But the French Connection was uh, Fritkin's major success, which came in 1972, a couple of months prior to the release of The Godfather. And what kind of a movie is the French Connection? Yeah, high school. Nice. Gina Kun plays a cop. Yes. And it's famous for that uh, cast, uh, car chase sequence where he's uh, chasing the train. Okay. Okay. Uh, please watch the French Connection. Okay. He he, he has uh, given you some of the uh, defining features of the film. William Friedkin was another um, member of this new Hollywood community, who was extremely influenced by the French new wave directors, especially the Godas, the, Fali, um, the Godas and the Truffauts, and also the Italian new realists like Fellini and Bertolucci. Those were their gods. Okay. There is a classic story when William Friedkin was shooting a mini series on Alfred Hitchcock. Okay. Uh, it was called this is Hitchcock or something like that. And the big man came to the set and he, sh were, he just watched William Fritkin shooting a series called this is Hitchcock. And he did not uh, utter a word about whatever Fritkin was doing. He just said one thing, Hitchcock to Fritkin famously, you must wear a tie. <laughs> you must wear a tie. Okay? And Fritkin said, See what the hell? I don't even like this guy. <laughs> it's not I am a that I am a fan. Okay, I come from the school of the Godas and the Trophos. Who is he to tell me to wear a tie and all? So it is that kind of. I'm just uh, narrating this anecdote to tell you that who were these people and who were they influenced by? They were not influenced. Perhaps Orson Welles. Yes, that was a major influence, but not the classic Hollywood types. Definitely, their influence. Perhaps Elia Kazan, who is East of Eden, you recently um, watched. Okay, so New Hollywood was essentially a rebellion against the classic Hollywood school of filmmaking. So, uh, Coppola, throughout the filming, insisted on casting New York actors rather than uh, established names. Apart from Marilyn Brando, no one is an established name in the movie. Everyone is a newcomer. Uh, there was a call for actors and all these bit parts were enacted by theatre people from New York com theatre community. Okay. Al Pacino, Al Pacino, Robert Duvall. Duvall uh, was, yes, yes, but not uh, a box office uh, magnet. Even Marilyn Brando at that point was considered a box office poison. It was said, and Coppola admits that p the studios, to, uh, to the executives told him that if you take Marilyn Brando, whoever is coming to watch the movie, even they will stay away. <laughs> okay, he was that much of a poison to people. Okay, so uh, Marilyn Brando was not wanted. Pacino definitely not wanted. James Khan, yes, people were studio executives because he was 
considered quite good looking movie star good look. So, the, the actor who plays Sonny, yes. So, uh, casting of uh, Pacino was a major contentious issue and Robert Evans particularly disliked him. They wanted Robert Redford in that role and uh, they uh, Coppola insisted on using non trained, non professional actors. For example, the bodyguard Luca Brasi, okay, uh, that wa he was a professional wrestler, okay, and if you look at him, he is huge, he looks the part, he is the one who gets strangulated in the restaurant. By who? By who? Solozzo. By Solozzo. Good, good. You have been watching the movie. By Solozzo. Okay. Um, adherence to the ambience. Now, what ambience is that? When is the movie set? Good. 40s. 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 Uh, a dead giveaway clue is that Michael is a war hero. He returns from a war. And which world war could it be? The second world war. Okay. It is the 40s. So, he wanted to adhere to the ambience and that is very important because if you remember the mafia, the original screenplay, I am not talking about the novel The Godfather by Mario Puzo. The studio had commissioned Puzo to write a screenplay called The Mafia, remember, which no one wanted to direct. So, the studio compelled uh, Puzo to uh, rework the draft of uh, The Mafia based on The Godfather and set the ambience in the 70s with hippies in it and rock and roll music. Okay, because they said this is what is selling, you know, Easy Rider was a major success, Bonnie and Clyde. Okay, so, why, why make a movie of, of the 40s, which will be such a cumbersome <laughs> project and uh, uh, definitely expensive, because you have to recreate a period. The 70s are here, here and now. So, let us uh, try to do that. Let us try to take advantage of the hippies around us and let us fill it with drugs and all kinds of interesting things, so that people will come. So, but uh, Coppola yearned for a particular period, the post war America, when American power in business as well in as well as in politics was at its peak. So, that is the period he wanted to capture and it meant period cars, having period cars, period costumes sets, restaurants, clothes, everything has to be true and faithful to the period, that is the 40s. So, if you watch the movie, you will find it is so real, it is so authentic. Uh, the famous scene where Michael uh, first come, uh, comes across the news of his father being gunned down. He is not killed, but he, he just reads it uh, on one of the newspaper stands, case stops and she directs his attention to that and there is a newspaper stand. And do you, would you believe it, that suddenly Coppola was told by his art direction team, that in the 40s there would be no newspaper stands. Okay, and what does he do? And then, the next shot is, that Michael reads the headline and uh, runs across the street and goes to a telephone booth. And it so happened, that uh, um, on that because it that scene was shot on location okay so actually on an uh, actual street and he was told during the 40s there was no phone booth here okay so what do you do okay so he said okay let's just get it okay you know some imagination some poetic license has to be there let's create a kiosk let's create a phone booth so it was there it's shot on location yes but they also did a lot of recreating the the recreation of the period. So, that is how difficult it, it always is. 40s cars, I mean if you watch the movie, it is not the 70s cars, I mean all those black car, little cars, they all belong to the period. Okay. Another important and uh, I think this is one of the most defining feature and uh, of new Hollywood period as well as of the godfather in particular is that. Uh, uh, they eschewed the theme of good versus evil. But then I am going to give you another example, which soon came after The Godfather and took a, a very regressive kind of cinema, which took Hollywood again years back in time. But then we will talk about that soon in our later classes. 
so, the no good versus evil theme, which is again an import of the French new wave. You will also find that in, uh, uh, in the world of these, uh, of the ma mafia, there are no civilian deaths. So, you do not feel get women being dishonored or um, uh, people just being shot dead rampantly, it is all about a gang war. Okay. So, uh, the only person who represents the law is the corrupt police officer and he is also shot dead early in the movie by Michael. So, the question that the film raises very aptly is what is evil, the qu nature of evil. How many of you have read the novel? Oh, quite impressive, you have read the novel. Okay. Um, Shweta, uh, do you think that the novel, the movie is quite faithful? Give me uh, a couple of reasons. Please focus on her. She has read and he has read. So, after that and after that, the little girl in red. We saw that three people. Largely faithful, although there are certain elements in the books which don't really aren't really focused upon in the movie. Yes. Like for instance, the wedding in the beginning when Sunny is with that woman and how all the rumors surrounding Sunny's virility and all of that, that isn't really touched upon in the movie as such. Okay. And uh, apart from that, Luca Brasi is a more prominent role in the books. Yes. It's mentioned in great detail how he butchers a lot of people. Actually, there are plenty of plots. Okay, which so when I first read the, the I, I, in fact, I first re watched the no movie and then read the novel, and I felt, what is this? Okay, now where is the movie here? And uh, I am glad he did the movie the way he did. Okay, so the screenplay is written uh, by Mario Puzo in collaboration with Coppola, and Coppola has gone on record stating that he was ex extremely put off by the novel at certain places and if you read the novel, you will understand what places. Okay. He felt that, what am I making? <laughs> you know, and there are subplots, which are so huge and which are so voluminous, which have nothing to do with the main plot. They just go on and on and on and you wonder, what is happening here. So, it is pulp to the core, okay. but then Coppola raised it to the level of art. Okay, so, this is one instance where the movie is any day better than the novel. Okay. Forget that he has left out several things, okay, but he has whatever he has in, and there are certain scenes which are not there in the novel, but they do figure in the movie and I will tell you where and the reason why I was trying to draw your attention to Robert Town, who wrote a couple of scenes okay, and therefore, you know cinema is an art. Uh, comes into picture. So, now, uh, we are talking about uh, how the movie was photographed by Gordon Willis and this is an important name, cinematographer Gordon Willis, who liked to shoot in closed spaces, dark shuttered rooms, just to give that feel of the claustrophobic world of the mafia, as contrasted with the sunny, brightly lit atmosphere of the wedding. And many, we were ca calling the movie the other day, uh, the best home movie Coppola ever made. That is what he, that is the term he uses for the film, that is the best home movie I ever made. And um, uh, uh, there are instances, if you read up on the history of or the making of The Godfather, then in several of the uh, sequences, for example, in baptism scene, in the wedding scene, uh, Coppola uses his own family members as part of the crowd. Okay. So he's, it is like, you know, that is the uncle and that is an aunt and that is my mother kissing the baby and all those things. Okay, um, influence of a cinematographer Vittorio Storaro, a regular with Bernardo Bertolucci. Okay, so, the Gordon Willis was hugely influenced by Storaro, but more than Gordon Willis, it was the Coppola himself, because Coppola was a disciple of Bartolici and therefore, uh, he wanted that kind of an impact, that kind of an Italian feel, the movie. Interestingly, the hospital scenes, where Michael is trying to save his father, okay, the beautifully short scenes are done by George Lucas, a great friend of 
Coppola, great admirer of Coppola. But then which film did he make? Forget American Graffiti, yes, Star Wars and after that equations were changed forever. <laughs> then Coppola became a disciple, <laughs> but that is another story. Okay. So, there is hospital scenes and if you remember the hospital scene, one of the best scenes in the movie, they are shot by George Lucas. Uh, if you remember how the movie is generally, the look of the movie, earthy brown, yellow in places and uh, what Coppola wanted was an authentic church like uh, influence. Okay. Uh, music, music is uh, uh, composed by, one is uh, Coppola credits his own father. Yesterday I was talking about Coppola's father being a musician himself, flutist, uh, Carmen. Carmen Coppola, okay, he was a professional, uh, quite well regarded artist. So, he contributed a lot, but the real music or the, the major part of the credit goes to uh, Nina Rota, who was a regular of Fellini. So, look at Coppola's influences again, Bartolucci, Fellini, all the great Italian masters. Now, uh, at this point I would like to draw your attention to another great movie, which is made by Bartolucci called The Conformist, which came a few years, just two years before The Godfather. And many critics, especially people like David Thompson, have read uh, thematic parallels between Michael Corleone's character and the leading character, the lead character in Bartolucci's the conformist. Bertolucci's conformist, which is uh, all about uh, how a regular, ordinary, decent guy is caught between the forces of <laughs> two uh, opposing forces of ordinary life, leading an ordinary life and a life of betrayal and fascism. So, he has, he is forced to choose between the two. So, loyalty towards his friends or uh, be an outcast, be a misfit in a society where uh, loyalties are uh, sold every day. Okay. And he decides to choose to conform. Okay. And if you look into Michael Corleone's character, he decides to let go of his essential humanity, decency, uh, at least by the end of the second godfather when he orders his brother's death. Okay. So, he is now the face of Satan himself, okay, that is what he turns into him. If you think of how he began and look at the graph of his character, the way he begins and the way he ends in the second godfather, quite a transition. So, what is uh, the conformist all about? A regular decent fellow who becomes to becomes a, a victim of every sin, every weakness he has always, always dreaded in himself. That is the conformist, that is the basic core idea of the conformist. One of these days we will be watching the movie, but then if you look at, if you watch the movie, you will find there are a strong parallels between the, uh, the guy in the conformist and Michael Corleone. When he has to make a choice, he chooses to conform. So, this is Michael before and yesterday I was trying to draw your attention to the way he looks, the way he dresses, the look on his face and then by the end of the first godfather, when he orders the killing of his brother in law and uh, confronts the Lyasha character and by now he is almost the godfather. Okay, um, another feature of the new Hollywood cinema, like their French predecessors, like their Italian uh, influences, shot on locations. And uh, this is uh, uh, one of the main locations where Godfa the Godfather was shot, Radio City. When does this occur in the movie? Well, it is a theatre, you know, and this is the time when they are coming out, uh, Kay and Michael, 
yeah, yeah, they are coming out and then they discover that the god, godfather has been shot, okay. so shot on actual location. So, legacy what, what godfather did to us and uh, uh, how everyone's life changed after the godfather, Brando made a stunning comeback, that is the most important legacy, but then equally important is that the movie made his stars, he gave us the movie gave the cine enthusiast a stunning actor called Al Pacino. Okay, and if you look at his body of work, then you will understand what I am talking about. Okay, even till his very recent any given any given Sunday or insomnia, we know what Al Pacino is. Okay, so the studios were extremely wrong about him, and of course, Coppola is the one who uh, proved the studios wrong about him. James Khan, yes, he also achieved a reasonable degree of success, not as much as Pacino, not as much as De Niro, but anyway. Method acting came into its own, everyone started talking about method, method was always there, James Dean, method acting, right, Monty Clift, Malin Brando, but then with Robert Duval, Al Pacino, James Kahn and also Robert De Niro, method acting, Dustin Hoffman, the graduate, which was released along the uh, around the same period. So, method acting became the new mantra of all actors. It was no longer necessary to be movie star good look, good looking or to have the conventional good looking face uh, associated with movie stars. I mean Al Pacino, De Niro, Dustin Hoffman, Jack Nicholson, definitely not the conventionally good looking actors, but actors. Okay, and they, they, they are still around. So, influence on people, um, Coppola is a couple of years older to these people, um, De Palma, George Lucas, Martin Scorsese, Spielberg, Michael Cimino, who is Michael Cimino? Other names I am very sure you are familiar with, who is Michael Cimino? One great movie. After that, never achieve. But you can see, you can sense the inf the Coppola, the Godfather influence. One great movie. We'll talk about it. Okay, it's there. And of course, Michael Mann. Michael Mann doesn't need any introduction. You know who is Michael Mann? You know who is Michael Mann? No, Michael Mann is the director of Heat, The Insider, yes, Collateral. Last of the Mohicans, what else? Public enemies, okay. It is a very lengthy, very impressive list. Okay. So, look up Michael Mann, one of the greatest contemporary artists. Now, because uh, in between what happened, what did uh, Coppola do? That is a question. <laughs> what did Coppola do between the first and second godfathers? As a Good, the conversation. Okay, so, there in between the two godfathers, he was keeping himself gainfully employed and he made the conversation with Gene Hackman. Gene Hackman, fresh from the success of the French connection. And what is the conversation all about? Espionage, surveillance, okay, uh, tapping other people's conversations. And he is a guy, Gene Hackman is a specialist in an expert in this area and he is employed by rich people to spy on each other. And he never questions, again a notion, the notion of conformity, he never questions, he never, he is not even interested in knowing why he is being asked to do as long as he is getting paid for it. He uh, taps people's conversation, but then there is a lot of moral ambiguity in the movie, the conflict between the individual with himself and the society. We were talking about the recurring motifs in Coppola. Okay, so, that is what you will find in the conversation as well. A great movie, it did not do well at all, obviously, because it did not have uh, the ingredients associated with the godfather and we have already seen 
what were those ingredients. Um, yeah, before I uh, go to the second godfather, let me talk about a bit since I broached the topic Robert Town. Now, what is Robert Town's contribution to the godfather? There is a scene between Brando and Pacino, a little before uh, Don Corleone dies. Okay, and what does he tell his son? It is a very intimate father mano a mano kind of a sequence. What is it all about? Good. Godfather Bandini and uh, how he wanted Sonny to become the godfather and never wanted him to become the godfather. Yeah. Like the dog. Yes. Okay. Uh, he tells him, he, you know, we were talking about universal wisdom, and he said, the guy who comes to set the meeting, fix the meeting, he is the traitor. Remember that. And who is that guy? Brazini. Tessio, okay, fine. Okay, so um, the guy who comes to set up the meeting, so that father has given a very useful piece of advice to his son before dying. And that is a scene which was written in by Robert Town. Okay. It does not exist in the novel. And why did they do it? Can you guess why this scene was inserted at all in the movie? It came at the fag end. Uh, Kapula says that the uh, primary shooting of the movie was all over and he had been kicked around by everyone <laughs> and there were also studio henchmen to beat him up and his <laughs> the studio had, had employed people <laughs> to beat him up at any point and uh, just uh, you know to pick him and throw him. Kapula was a huge man, okay. he looks like a big bear, you know one of those stuffed teddy bears. That is one reason why he employed so many of his uh, family members <laughs> on the set, especially his sister. Okay, and he says that before they could fire me, I used to fire all the people who were loyal to the studio. So, it was a big tug of war between the studio and the director. So, which scene, uh, uh, that scene was written in, my question was, why do you think this scene was written at all, when he was so eager to finish and wrap the movie and get it out of his way. Exactly. exactly. Good. Excellent. Uh, in the entire movie, uh, the father and the son, they never meet face to face by themselves. They are always surrounded by other people. There is always someone. Okay, but this is one scene which is, which actually looks like their father is having a conversation with his son, giving him some uh, pieces of worldly advice, etcetera, etcetera, which you never find throughout the movie. He is always, Brando is Brando. Otherwise, you have the hospital scene. But you do not find the father and the son having a conversation. And this scene brought a very strong emotional touch to the film. Also the fact that by the time the movie was over, everyone realized that what great performances were delivered by both Brando and Pacino. And the studio insisted that we must have a scene where these two men come face to face. And Coppola said he did not know what to do, so he approached his good friend Robert Town and he said, help me out and if you want credit, I will give you a writing credit as well. And Robert Town said, no, I do not want credit, any credit for that. Robert Town also went, uh, went on to write the script for another great movie called, you must do your homework on Robert Town. Okay, that is the way it is spelled T O W N E. So, all his screenplays. Okay. So, um, now, so the second godfather gave Coppola the freedom to do things his way, it is an original material. Okay. So, that is what Coppola had always wanted, not to use someone's material, but to use his own material. By now, he had already established his own studio facility, Zotrop. Remember, we were talking about that was his dream. To the first, the main reason why he agreed to do the godfather was that he could make enough money to uh, establish his own studio and that was the Zotrop. So, uh, audacious in terms of its narrative style, it moves back and forth in time, between time and spaces, periods. Okay, so, the first godfather, the young godfather played by De Niro, Vito Corleone. And then 
uh, um, you have Michael now trying to face his own internal demons. So, when the movie was originally uh, shot, it had 20 cuts between past and present, but then it was felt that uh, it was uh, befuddling and too confusing. So, then uh, Coppola decided to reduce the length, uh, reduce the cuts to 12 only and not 20. Again, a great actor, uh, two great actors coming back, uh, coming together for the first time, De Niro and Pacino. However, they never come face to face together, it's, they are the, but they are there in the movie. In counterpoint to Michael's struggles, both inside, inner and out, uh, outer, we also see Don Vito's constant, consistent rise to power. The movie, uh, you would be surprised to know that the first Godfather was a modestly budgeted movie. People did not want to spend money on Coppola or his team or whoever he had brought on board. By the second movie, he was big enough to invest his own money and to make certain demands and he got what he wanted and it is epic in scope. So, there are certain movies in, in, in the first Godfather which were supposed to be shot on location in New York, but then they were forced to shoot in LA to cut costs etcetera. But here he did whatever he wanted to and then you can see Hubris coming and striking an apocalypse now and then what he did to himself after apocalypse now, because then it we, you know the downfall begin, because he there was a point when it was felt that Coppola can do no wrong okay, and that is how great people fall. So, um, the second godfather is epic, it is shot in New York, actual locations. LA, Las Vegas and Cuba, Havana, if you remember those scenes and Sicily, especially the childhood scenes. And of course, money was spent on the movie, gave us the great De Niro, but then De Niro was already great. He had mean streets behind him and taxi driver, he was working on taxi driver simultaneously. So, he was there and uh, again method acting at work. The second godfather as opposed to the classic Greek tragedy structure of the first godfather, again more uh, experimental in its narrative style, more inward looking, more allegiac and reflective. Al Pacino got nominated seven times for the Academy Award before he won it for Center for Women, De Niro won it for the second godfather, very early in his career. Great scenes from the second godfather, one is the investigation scene, lengthy, but again a very, very uh, a brave, very courageously shot scene, too many people, lots of people involved there. Then you know it is a very, very chaotic ensemble, but if you watch it, you will, you know, uh, you get swept away by the magnitude of the scene. Okay. De Niro's scenes in Little Italy, Fredo's shooting at Lake Tahoe and of course, Coppola himself never had a very easy relationship with his brother and that is what, so you know Coppola is always interested <laughs> in these sibling rivalries and all and Fredo's killing by his own brother could be a reference. As we were talking, as Godard has already told us that everybody owes everything to Orson Welles. So, influence of Citizen Kane, palpable, journey of a protagonist here Michael Corleone, his spiritual, his material, his rise to power, his alienation and then final decline and fall of a megalomaniac. So, he suffers, he becomes a victim to his own pride, his own hubris, almost like a Greek hero. Coppola holding his three Oscars, now that suffers and who was he competing against that year in 74, against himself, 
okay, the conversation for the conversation also he was nominated. So, you can imagine therefore, it is not for no reason that we call Coppola at the center of the universe. There was a time when he was the center of, of the universe of the so called new Hollywood period. Now, it may appear very strange to you that whatever happened to Coppola, what was his last movie? No one remembers. You remember what is Spielberg's last movie? Lincoln. Lincoln. Okay, you do remember. And Lincoln is still hot. It's honored. Uh, Oscars are around the corner. Are you betting on Lincoln? Are you betting on Day Lewis? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. How many of you are betting on Day Lewis? At least best actor. Watch the movie. He is Lincoln. Okay, watch the movie. Have you watched the movie, Paleri? You are not betting on him? You did? Okay. Azhar? Okay, watch uh, the trailer at least on YouTube. Okay, and you will find he is not Day Lewis. You feel that is Lincoln talking to you. Okay. So, whatever happened to Coppola, he won three Oscars in one year while he was competing against himself. Tetro. Tetro. Uh, when, it, when did it release? 2009. Oh. Yeah, no one knows. No one cares, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. Okay. And that is what he says. You see, uh, he is an honest man. And the, he says, in some way, the godfather ruined me. <laughs> okay. It just made my whole career go this way instead of the way I really wanted to go, which was into doing original work as a writer, director. He could never live down that success, that those expectations. Because see, from when you are at the top, the only way to go <laughs> further is to go down. And he started at the top. He influenced a generation of filmmakers. Okay, but then for him, it was like how to excel himself. And then he went into the second Godfather, which was a huge commercial success as well as a critical. Uh, so, for some, for many people, and if you ask me, yes, it's much better than the first Godfather. Less sentimental, more reflective, more uh, inwardly aware and conscious. So, Coppola, the conversation in 1974, Apocalypse Now in 1979, a movie which although most ruined him financially, and. Uh, there are books written on the making of Apocalypse Now, and it is a harrowing read. So, you can just imagine what he must have gone through. Yeah. And he, he, he used to take pride in his uh, um, audaciousness, <laughs> audacities. He would say that if it rains or it snows, all the more better, because we are going to get real shots, not the screen generated, the machine generated rain sequences and all. But he was told that you see, where, where was the movie was, where was the movie shot? Apocalypse now. Oh no, not in Vietnam. They weren't given. Philippines. Yeah. And it would always rain and he chose to shoot the movie <laughs> when it was like uh, the rainy season was at its peak. And when the rainy season was at its peak, the boatmen would shudder to <laughs> the, you know ride the boats with the crew, but then he was a uh, fearless. He would say, okay, does not matter. Okay, so, that was Coppola and he brought it on himself. Um, so, Apocalypse Now with Martin Sheen, Brando of course, and Dennis Hopper and the legend goes that Brando hated Hopper so much, they, that they, he did not even want to do the scenes together. They said, shoot him separately, shoot me separately, combine the shots. Okay, it was not that Pacino Brando. And uh, this is another interesting anecdote. I was uh, recently reading a book called Conversations with Al Pacino and the interviewer asked him that what did you learn from Marilyn Brando. Guess what he said? What did you learn from the great Brando on the sets of the Godfather? Guess what he said? Al Pacino's response was not to eat too much ice cream. Then Frankenstein, he produced, directed by Kenneth Branagh, Helena Bonham Carter, Robert De Niro plays the monster, okay, but produced by 
Coppola, Mary Shelley, uh, uh, Wollstonecraft's Frankenstein, Bram Stoker's Dracula, great movie, excellent movie. Okay, not many people have watched it, but a decent success. But again, you can't touch the Godfather. Okay, so watch Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula, and also Coppola is known for putting the writer's name above his own, in spite of his megalomania. So the movie is actually called Bram Stoker's Dracula. Gary Oldman doing an excellent Dracula. Keanu Reeves is Keanu Reeves. Okay. And, but then uh, you, uh, you have Gary Oldman, you have Winona Ryder and who play Anthony Hopkins. Watch it for them, not for Keanu Reeves. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then Tetro, the latest one in 2009. Influences now. We were talking about Michael Cimino and one great movie. One gra that was a clue, you see one, great, one shot. <laughs> Remember? One shot you get. Watch The Deer Hunter if you have not. It is not a mafia movie, but it is Chimino's attempt to bring together a huge ensemble cast and what he can, because there are no heroes there. De Niro is there at the center, but of course, it is not just about De Niro. It is also about Meryl Streep. It is also about John Savage. It is also about Christopher Walken and John Cazale. Okay, so and also remember the opening shot of the deer hunter. How does it begin? Wedding sequence. Yes, it's a homage to the great Coppola. A lengthy wedding sequence, excellently done. Name the movie. Jewish uh, American gangsters, classic. Nineteen eighty-three. Yes, Once Upon a Time in America, Sergio Leone. I deliberately did not put the title because I wanted you to. Yes, again De Niro and James Wood, same theme, oh, but extremely experimental in nature. Watch the movie. So, one of these days we should watch it. It is four and a half hours running length, but it requires patience, but great movie. The Untouchables, more uh, successful, the Palmer directed it, Kevin Costner, Sean Connery won the Oscar, Andy Garcia one of his earlier roles, Robert De Niro doing El Capone, De Palma's Scarface, again decline and fall of a megalomaniac, Scorsese's, a great friend of Coppola, always looked up to him. Okay, he also looks like a miniature Coppola, if you look, <laughs> look at him, you know, same structure, ex except that Coppola is huge and Marty is tinier. Carlito's Way, who directed it? Who are the two actors, Al Pacino and Sean Penn, Brian De Palma? Heat, of course, Michael Mann, 1995, Donnie Brasco, 1997. So, these are the children of Coppola, the influence, the children of the Godfather. Okay, and I would suggest that you do visit if you want to know more about Coppola and his work in detail. So, www.zotrop.com, it gives you a very good overview of his. Cinema. Thank you very much. We continue tomorrow.